we are going to be in several passages tonight, actually, um, starting in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, which is one we've done before, and Psalm 50, 54, 4, and then a, a couple of verses out of Mark 10. So the Genesis 2, 18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. In Psalm 54, 4, Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. And then Mark 10, 42 through 45, kind of some context for this. Uh, a couple of the disciples approached Jesus and said, we'd like you to do whatever um, we ask you to do. And this is what he said. He calls them everybody together because the other 10 get really upset by that. And he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life in ransom for many. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together today. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide our discussion, challenge us, and grow us in our relationships and our ability to relate to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're kind of back to that idea of covenant still hanging around in there and the, the idea of the wedding ceremony and the vows, the promises we make. And this is the final promise. We've had the promise of love. I will love, honor, and cherish. One of the vows that we make when we get married. Um, the vow of permanence or faithfulness we talked about last week, kind of a trustworthiness thing. I will be true to you until death alone shall separate us. The permanence part of it. And then the vow of responsibility. I will respect, trust, help, and care for you keywords kind of help and care in that idea. And, it's, and it's, it's really interesting because for some reason this vow of responsibility seems to be the easiest to not participate in, uh, the easiest one kind of to forget about and to forsake. Um, in, in 28 years of marriage counseling, I have yet to encounter a troubled marriage that fails to present with some sort of responsibility issues. There's always some responsibility issues. Usually it manifests in the form of one partner or one family member feeling that they're carrying the lion's share of the, the load of what's going on in the family. Um, it's not fair because he doesn't do this or she doesn't do that or they, you know, they're not carrying their weight. So there's always a sense of what do we do with this sense of responsibility? Somebody's lacking in responsibility or is assumed to be lacking in responsibility. And it means that teamwork or help, as Genesis, Genesis puts it, is lacking. The one thing that, that Adam needed is he needed somebody like him who would help him. He couldn't do all the work that God called him to do on his own. It wasn't, he wasn't designed to do that. Um, it also means when, when we're in a relationship where responsibility is lacking, that we're struggling to become one flesh. We, we talked about that early on in this series, that one flesh is more than just um, sexual intimacy. It is the idea that this person and this person make each other whole, and when they come together in marriage, they are working to not lose their identity. They're working to fulfill the image of God in each other and as a unit. We, we, as, as a single individual without community, I am not able to represent God the way I should, but when I'm in relationship to others, all of a sudden I'm able to fulfill the identity of God and the, and the image of God in a, in a more complete way. So failure to fulfill the promise of responsibility indicates that we've revor reverted kind of to our normal way of living during our single years. We, we live for ourselves because there's nobody else around. That makes total sense. And we tend to live without regard for the needs and concerns of others because what? We're living on our own. It makes total sense. So failure to fulfill the promise of responsibility in a marriage um, is, is really easy to do, but it also is an indicator that we haven't grown out of our singleness and moved toward oneness with that other person. Um, obviously, you know, we know that the new priorities of marriage and family demand a shift to some sort of other-centered living. Um, you, you get married and all of a sudden you realize how selfish you are, and you also realize how selfish the other person is because there's always something you're kind of contesting or upset about or some unfairness that's not fair that's not just um, you're not taking your responsibility type of stuff that goes on in there um, so we have we have to go okay I have to shift to this serve the other person care for the other person be a good teammate with the other person and that's part of our responsibility in covenant relationships so to improve our fulfillment of the vow of responsibility it's helpful to look at three things the root of irresponsibility where does that come from uh, how to become a suitable helper and what are our spheres of responsibility? Because it's not just our family that we're responsible for. And we'll kind of look at, you know, who's my neighbor kind of question in, a, in just a few minutes. So 
the root of the root of irresponsibility. What lies behind our failure to fulfill the promise of responsibility? Um, you stand, you stand at an altar, you stand before a pastor or, or a judge, and you say, you know, I will care for you, I will help you, I will be your partner. Um, what is it that lies behind our failure to fulfill that promise when we don't fulfill it? What do you think? Okay, so so we fail at the idea of commitment when we're when we're not doing this. Definitely, anything else that that might cause us to not quite fulfill that responsibility role the way we should? Yeah, yeah. So so we're reverting to um, a, a self-centered way of living and looking at life, or m- maybe maybe we haven't really challenged our selfishness, especially early on in a marriage. We don't challenge that selfishness the way we should. I think that grows with time. Uh, yeah, what do I get out of it? What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? Um, right. If I'm doing this, what are you going to do? And so we're, we're all of a sudden back to the transactional contractual type of relationship, right? That's those thoughts of what am I getting out of it really is a transactional. If I do this for you, you should do this for me. And we get in that sense of injustice. They're not carrying their weight because look at all the stuff I'm doing. Um, so this isn't, this isn't fair. Yeah. So, th- so all of these things, you look at this, if there's a lack of commitment, there's self-centeredness, there's a, hey, what do I get out of it attitude. Um, we're actually all results of the fall in Genesis 3, aren't they? Let me start thinking back about it. It's kind of interesting how that rolls out. Um, what, you know, why do we struggle to serve each other? Why does it seem that we're being irresponsible? You know, irresponsibility for human beings seems almost instinctive. You know, you have kids. How many times do you have to tell your kids to do what you've asked them to do every week for their entire lives? Take out the garbage. You do this every week on Thursday. How hard is this? Why do I have to, right? Irresponsibility seems instinctive. Well, where is it? Genesis 2 and 3 have the answers, right? God, God established the ideal for human relationships and creation. The ideal, of course, right? So <laughs> I love that because we know that we don't, live, uh, we don't live in the ideal at all. But the ideal for human relationships is equality. We've talked about that at length and we'll probably do one, one session, especially on Paul's statements about women in the New Testament and how, how does re- redeeming and getting equality be there. So equality, shared purpose. So you have the idea of purpose that flows into that concept as well, and joyous mutual servanthood. So those are great words, and we all look for that. We want that in our relationships. We want to be that in our relationships because we know that's the healthiest thing for the relationship. But on the flip side of that, wow, is that hard to do because we are on this side of sin, right? We we operate in this lack of commitment, self-centeredness, what's in it for me attitude, and this, this is an alternative way of living. This takes work. Uh, it takes a retraining of the way we do things. Um, it, honestly, it takes a retraining of the instinct because the instinct is toward irresponsibility. And, and, and we all know this. You can see that in children. We see it in adults. Um, man, we have to retrain that into this. I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to treat the other person with e- equality. We have equality of purpose, equality of, of status. And we're supposed to be here to serve each other and others. Um, so... Ideally, we work together without conflict, without self-interest, without injustice, um, and with a sense of combined purpose and joy. Uh, we would attack problems and projects with equal energy, equal enthusiasm, equal effort, equal responsibility. We know that doesn't happen. Um, in an ideal world, there would be no sense of injustice. Well, that's not fair, you know, all that stuff that we deal with. Everybody would feel that each part, party was carrying their weight. And we were in this together. There's fairness would be realized. We would eagerly serve in every aspect of life, but we obviously know that's that's not the case. This is what this is what we're working toward. But because we're on this side of sin, this is a redemptive ideal. Jesus died so that we could restore and be reconciled to God and restore some of these things to some degree. Um, And so that's what we have to work with. So sin, as we know, is the problem, right? Sin damaged God's ideal and it warped our sense of it warped the sense of servanthood um, and that's really what it does it's it's not that human beings don't want to serve each other and other people we I mean man we find a great deal of fulfillment in serving people whether we whether we were in Jesus or not I, you know I think of 
some work I've done with local community charity things outside of ch the church world, and people love to serve. I mean, I, I am certain that, that every person that stands at a red kettle ringing a bell at Christmas time is not a redeemed Christian human being. But they love to serve because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's that thing, the image of God in us as we like to, but sin does what? It warps it. You know, we do it for a variety of reasons. We don't do it the way we should. Uh, we have varying motivations and who knows, right? So, so it warps, warps the sense of servanthood. And in, in the seamless act, uh, seemingly harmless act of disobeying God's directive in the garden, right? Adam and Eve shattered this tranquil balance of human relationships. There's a beautiful balance of human relationship. And it just, boom, wrecked it. Um, and the results of their sinning, remember? the influx of negative emotions immediately. Shame, guilt, all this stuff that they never expected, weren't wired for, comes rushing in. They, they were terrified of what God would say. So there's the wrong kind of fear. Um, the nature of work changed forever. So that, that's huge with servanthood because servanthood usually is work. It, it requires some effort. And, and in the fall, the nature of work changed. It's no longer automatically fulfilling to do stuff. In fact, it's hard work, and it becomes frustrating, which fuels a sense of injustice if one person isn't carrying their weight. And we find that at home. We find it at work. You know, if there's one person that's not quite doing what they should at work, everybody else has to make up the difference, and it makes them angry. Um, and it, it leads to a lack of s the sense of fulfillment in our work, okay? Um, domination, competition. Um, your husband will dominate you, and you will have a desire to dominate him. Um, the, the curse on Eve, part of the curse on Eve. So there's this, we're no longer e operating equally. We're no longer operating with cooperation. Um, it's a completely different thing. We're not team members anymore. Now we're competitors. And that's, that's a dangerous thing in relationships when you become competitors. Um, we, we're more likely to compete for leadership roles. We prefer to dominate rather than just humbly serve. So sin warps servanthood dramatically. So that's the root of all this irresponsibility. You go right back to Genesis 1 through 3, and you see this is what happened. We were responsible. We were equal. We were teammates. We were cooperative. Then sin entered, and it just damaged it, wrecked that whole thing. And then the question becomes, now, how do I become a suitable helper? I'm sin damaged. My idea of servanthood is warped. My sense of responsibility is damaged, but I'm still required to be some sort of suitable helper to my spouse, to people in my family, in my household, to people in my neighborhood, to, in my church, there, there is a sense of responsibility that has to be retrieved out of this sin warped thing, right? God, God, it's interesting, God created women and men to be suitable helpers to each other. That's his goal, that's his ideal. The concept of suitability is important on this side of the fall, it's our goal. We want to be suitable. It's not instinctive. We have to work at it. We have to develop it as a skill. Um, that's why marriage is often very difficult because we're not really flowing in the suitability world. The question is, what does it mean to be suitable? What does it mean to be suitable? I will give Adam a suitable helper. Um, what on earth is God talking about there? Adam needs a suitable helper. What do you think? Yeah, so there, there's an element of competence that is included in that sense of suitability. What else do we think of when we think of suitability? Yes, um, so how do we put that? Oh, thank you, yes, compliment. They're a compliment to us. They make up what we're lacking. Okay, so Adam is there. It's not good for man to be alone. That's not just a statement about his aloneness. It's a statement about his inability to, to be the complete image of God. He needs a complement to him so that they can work together to develop this beautiful image of God. Yes, yeah, so suitability, competence, complement. Um, anything else you can think of? Those are great, by the way. Um, okay. Here's a couple things. At its most fundamental, suitability means that we are complementary. Okay, we are competent, we're complementary. Those are the two things right out of the gate. Um, without female and male, humans aren't the fullest representation of the image of God. Being God's image requires 
that we have both and that we live in community together. We're designed for that. Um, looking to the entire creation account, I love this. Fish without waters are incomplete. They don't have their complement, right? Birds without air, without wind, without, you know, currents are without their complement. They have to have those things to really fulfill their role. Humans, man without woman, woman without man, humans without community lack their complement. And they can't display their competence or grow their competence outside of that arena. Suitability includes equality, and we talk about this over and over and over again about equality. But if we view one person as inferior or unequal to the other, we won't function as suitable helpers. All of a sudden, we're working in that fallen arena of dominance. I'm better than you, therefore you listen to me. Um, type of dominance. Um, seeing one party as superior undermines the very concept of being complete. Um, if you're less than me in community, then I'm not going to be able to be completed by you because you're lesser than. I mean, you think of all the stupid things we do to, to drive people down and diminish them, but that's one of the things that we do. Um, suitable means one who is in front of or walks alongside of as an equal to and who does the stuff that you can't do. Oh, right, yeah, here we are. Competence and completeness, right? We're more competent in community, in relationship. It's an equality thing. Um, it obviously implies relationship. We have to have each other. And so it implies that the, the problem that God solves by creating Eve is loneliness, the need for companionship, completion, partnership. That has to be a part of what's going on here. Eve, Eve completes Adam by walking alongside of him, this idea of equality, uh, working with him in the mission, bringing God's reign wherever they go, right? So we're in this together. And that would obviously extend out to the larger human community because they weren't supposed to be just, them, just the two of them. They were supposed to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. So relationship is there. And then servanthood right up there. They were serving together. If we want to grow in suitability, we have to serve each other. There's no other way to do this. Um, Adam and Eve served God side by side in the garden before the fall. No sense of competition, no sense of insecurity. It was a beautiful thing. Um, they weren't concerned whether they served and gave with equity. It didn't matter if Adam served more one day and Eve less one day or ver vice versa. They were, cool. they were just serving together. Um, beautifully oblivious to all of that sense of inequity and then sin jumped in, right? So if, if we're going to become a suitable helper, we have to understand this is what suitability means, right? It, it just circles around those two, those two concepts. Um, and then there's, it's interesting because there's a couple of biblical principles of developing suitability that I think are really important. Um, and it starts with Christ-likeness. So just this, this idea of biblical principles is important. Because there's a couple, I mean, there's, there's numerous places that we could go. And I just chose to go to Mark 10 because we have that scenario where James and John come to Jesus. They're, they're kind of distant cousins um, because their mom is related to Mary. And so they, they're thinking they've got this in with Jesus because they're on the family tree. And hey, hey, cuz, you know, could you do something for us? Do anything we, I mean, it's a pretty bold question. Do anything we ask you to do. Wow, okay, son of God here. This is kind of kind of out of out of the normal league. But this is what they're doing. And Jesus obviously does, does not give an affirmative response to that. But then the other 10 figure it out and they're all, all hostile about it because they didn't think of it first. And then Jesus gathers them together and he just reveals, hey, if you want to be greatest, you must be least. It's not about dominance. It's not about co competing and, and ruling over. It's about service. Son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life and ransom for men. Okay, beautiful. So it's about serving. Not seeking the place of honor, not seeking the place of rulership or lordship um, is one of the biggest issues there. Because the world, and, and I love what Jesus says about that, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They dominate them. They're back in that Genesis 3. Your husband will rule over you. There, there's this dominance effect that, that settles in because of sin. They're going to dominate. And Jesus says, biblical principle? No, you're not going to dominate. You're going to serve. So you could say, our, our natural inclination is to dominate others and to rule over them. And Jesus says, no way. What you need to do is you need to serve. The, the cure for dominance is servanthood. If the temptation is, man, I'm going to be large and in charge, and I'm going to dominate them, and I'm going to tell them what to do, well, the first thing you should do is you should serve. I, I'm trying to think, I can't remember the guy's name who wrote the book. It's a, it's a wonderful book on leadership called Turn This Ship Around. He, he was a um, submariner. He was a captain of a nuke sub. 
And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty serious stuff. And he comes on board this nuclear sub and he understands that he doesn't know how, how everything functions on that sub. He knows it well, but he doesn't know it from the, the frame of reference as the people that are doing the, 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 that have the responsibility. And so he decides rather than dominating them as their you know, primary officer, he's going to ask them their opinion about how those places of responsibility should operate because they're the ones that really know what's going on. He doesn't know what it means to unplug the shore power. He knows how to give the order, but he doesn't know what it means and entails to do it, right? And so what he does is he takes this particular naval officer, he takes his place of authority and he says, well, I have the authority to order you to do it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the authority to tell me when it's time to give the order to do it because I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna put the authority where it belongs because you need the authority to make that decision. And so instead of dominating as, a, as the normal military flow would happen and just doing, what did he do? He pushed responsibility downward to the people that were actually doing the stuff. And in, in effect, he became the servant of everyone on that sub and he gained their, it, it took him six months to get it turned around. It had the worst service record in the Navy at the time. And he turned it completely around and they won awards for their service and capacity. It was really a pretty, pretty stunning experience. So when you look at that, e even in secular settings that tend to be dominating, what the best thing to do is push it down into service and try and take that dominant role and turn it around into a leadership form of service. I just love that, that concept. Um, so that's the Mark 10:45 thing. And it's daily lived, this biblical principle is daily lived out of the Luke 6:31 passage, which we, um, which we know as the golden rule, Luke 6:31. Um, do to others as you would have them do to you. I don't know anybody that likes to be dominated by other human beings. We don't like to be told what to do. We don't like them to lord it over us and demand it of us. You know, we, we just, we don't up. It, it's so much better when a person is willing to serve. And so when we look at that and we're thinking about the family members and our community members, if I don't want to be dominated by them, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I should not be dominating them. So I should be serving rather than dominating. And Jesus, Jesus is very clear, very clear about it. He makes a very clear statement about, you know what? It's not about domination. It's about if you want to be the ruler, you need to be the servant of everyone who is involved. And so that has to be kind of the operating procedure that we go by in that particular circumstance. So instead of looking at relationships through the lens of what others are failing to do, the golden rule invites us to act in ways that we want to be treated. So how do we treat others? How do I want to be treated? That I'm going to treat those individuals in that very specific way. And so those kind of become the biblical principles of how to become, <clears throat> how to become a suitable helper. If I want others to participate more fully in the responsibility of the relationship, which I do, right? Remember 28 years of marriage counseling. Oh, they're not pulling their weight. Okay. If I want them to more fully cooperate in the responsibility of a relationship, I have to make sure, certain that I'm taking and living responsibly first. Because if I'm not setting the tone, I really shouldn't be saying anything. How can I serve them? How can I take responsibility? And then if they continue to not take responsibility, then we have to sit down and have a talk. Right? We have to have that conversation. Because it's not, really, it's not fair for one person to carry the entire load. That's not how this is supposed to work. It's supposed to be teamwork, right? Um, so we have to look at the responsibility. But if I'm not taking responsibility and demanding you to take responsibility, there's a huge hypocrite sign that starts showing up. It's like, yeah, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. And, and, and if I'm sitting here doing nothing, that, first of all, that, that makes you a boss, but it doesn't make you a good one. Um, we know that the good boss does what? Serves, takes up their responsibility and shows the way. Um, and that's how we should lead in our homes. If, if we want others to serve, we have to serve them. Um, I remember my, my first Assemblies of God pastor when I was a, a college student, he, he used to just constantly, you know, especially for husbands, like, guys, you know, if you expect your wife to change the children, make sure that you change the children's diapers. You know, don't expect her to do anything you wouldn't do yourself and make sure you're doing it and participating in it. If you, if you would expect this family member to take out the garbage, participate in it and show them the way. You know, show them that you're serving too so that they're more inclined, oh, this is natural, we do this. And it, it, it doesn't magically work, but it tends to work really well. That, that's what I know about it. If I'm there just dominating, saying, your responsibility is this, you're, you know, and not doing anything myself, then everybody gets upset and they, they 
they don't dive in. But if I'm willing to serve like that naval officer that I was talking about, if I'm willing to serve and give them responsibility and say, hey, let's do this together, I'm willing to listen about how this is working, they're far more inclined to go, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm going to follow you as, as the leader, right? It makes total sense. Um, we expect responsibility. The question is, do we model it? Uh, hopefully, right? If, if I want you to be a responsible person, I need to make sure that you have an example of what that looks like. Then we take all of this and we go, okay, that's great for home. But, you know, is home my only sphere of responsibility? And of course not, right? <laughs> we have responsibility everywhere we go. And, you know, we think immediately of our work environments. We think even of recreational environments and just the mundane day-to-day -day things, we have responsibilities that we live in. And, and in response to his command to love our neighbors, um, an expert in the law asked Jesus to clarify, what does it mean to be a neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Right? Um, Luke 10, 29 through 37, it's, it's the um, Good Samaritan scene. Luke, Luke 10, 29 through 37. And it's interesting because really his question, I, I have a tough time believing that it was a sincere question. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? You know, if you're asking that question, you're trying to get out of the responsibility. And so Jesus gives him this big heavy speech about the Samaritan who, as a Jewish leader, he would deride because the guy was a half-breed, was not a pure Jew, had idolatrous background because he's a Samaritan, didn't worship in the right city at the right temple, all, all that stuff. And so he sets this beautiful parable up and says, okay, here's a guy that you wouldn't expect to do the stuff that the scriptures teach. He's on the road to Jericho, and he finds a guy who's beaten up. Well, what is the Samaritan, of course, is the good guy. He takes care of him. But the Jewish Levite, the, you know, the Pharisee, all these, these guys pass by and don't want anything to do with this guy. They're not the ones who do what's right. They don't have the sense of responsibility that it takes to care for it. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to say is, listen, you're just trying to get out of this question, but here's the response. As a Jewish leader, you know what, what love your neighbor means and you know who the neighbor is. It's anybody who needs your help and who presents as needing your help. So he clarifies it from the, for them. Your neighbor is pretty much everyone, especially those who tend to be marginalized in society and those that you have the ability to help. He doesn't ask you to do more than your, your resources or ability to do. Those that you despise, it doesn't matter who they are, we have a responsibility to care for those who come across our path. And this is interesting because in the history of Israel, there is a huge issue here. Um, one, of, one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Old Testament characters and books is the book of Jonah, right? And so there's, there's this huge buildup in Jonah to get to chapter 4. You know, we, we love the fact that you know, the Lord tells him, go to Nineveh, and there's a whole cultural background. The Ninevites have brutalized and abused the Israelites. Terrible stuff, just hard to imagine and mention in public. You know, they would skin military leaders and skin them alive and hang their skins on the city walls. I mean, the Ninevites were horrible people, violent people. They, they would take Jewish military people and put them out on the threshing floor, and then they'd run them over with a big stone, heavy stone rolling um, you know, like a big heavy roller, like a steamroller that would roll pavement. So these, these people, I understand why he didn't want to go there, right? Because I'm a Jew. Why would you send me to this place where these people despise us and they kill us? Horribly, they torture us. So we know that Jonah, he goes the other way, right? So he's, he's actually headed to Spain, hires his own boat, heads to Spain. He gets out in the Mediterranean somewhere and we have a storm. Most nor notably, the storm kicks up and the, the sailors try to do everything they possibly can. He's sleeping in the boat. Not really aware of it, right? And then all of a sudden, they, they wake him up and say, hey, pray to your God, do something. And he goes, I know why this is happening. I'm running from God. Throw me overboard. No, we're not going to throw you overboard. They redouble their effort, you know? And finally, it's like, seriously, throw me overboard. And all of a sudden, they throw him overboard. The storm calms. But God mercifully supplies a fish. Interesting side note, the sailors experience, I, I just, I'll probably write a book on this someday, I just, I just call it the collateral mercy of God. Um, so they throw the guy overboard. They're, they're caught up in his rebellion. They throw the guy overboard, and as soon as the storm calms when he's thrown overboard, they fall to their knees and they cry out to God, have mercy on us, right? So, so they're converted as a result of his stupidity, 
right? It's just, it's, it's a stunning story. It really is. So collateral mercy is a thing. And, and yes, I have that. I, I have the rights to that phrase. So that one's mine. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so there's this beautiful thing. And then he gets to Nineveh and what does he do? Okay, he proclaims the word. 30 days from now, the Lord will destroy the city and everybody repents and then he's mad. The whole thing is a build up to chapter four. In chapter four, you have what scholars call a lover's quarrel. Okay, so, so there's this lover's quarrel between Jonah and God. I knew that you were merciful and lo- full of loving kindness. And that's why I didn't want to come to Nineveh in the first place. Because I knew if they repented, you'd, you'd show mercy on these horrible people. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so that really is the issue here in Jonah. And, and Jonah serves really, I mean, it's, it's a story and it's an account, but it's also a parable. And it's, and it's a parable that teaches the Israelites that they really don't love their neighbors. Okay? It's right back it's right back to the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, in essence, is Jonah's story because the priest and the Levite walk on the other side and ignore the guy who's in need. The Samaritan comes along and what does he do? He saves the guy. He's generous to him. He shows love. He takes responsibility. Jonah, by, by running away from Nineveh in the first place, is ignoring his responsibility to the Ninevites. And he's ignoring what God wants to do through his love to the Ninevites. So he's, he's avoiding the whole sense of responsibility. And it's interesting, he's angry. He's sitting out on the sand dune outside the city of Mosul, Iraq, because that's what Nineveh is, is Mosul, Iraq. He's sitting outside at the sand dune overlooking the city, and he's counting the days off on his calendar, uh, 28 days, you know, a couple days, and God's going to strike him dead. He's hoping. And, and God provides him shade. But God also does what? provides a worm to eat the tree and kill the shade and make Jonah miserable. So they're having this lover's quarrel back and forth. And, and, and that's where it just drops us and it leaves the Israelites and anybody else who reads it saying, are you going to take responsibility and are you going to demonstrate God's love to the people around you? you? Get over to, you know, to this Luke 10 passage and you see almost the same thing. Here's, here's a group of Israelites that haven't learned the, the lesson of Jonah, his account and the parable that it contains. And they're just saying, you know what? Samaritans don't do that stuff. Oh, we're, we're the people of God. And Jesus is like, wait a minute. Let, let me push your button a little bit here. You're not loving the way you should love. You're not taking responsibility the way you should love. So, so his love is tangible. It takes responsibility. And, and that really is one of our spheres of responsibility is those outside the family of God, those outside our own household, those who desperately need to know the love of God. The Ninevites, of all people, needed to know the love of God. They were the most violent people on earth. They, Yes. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's love without the expectation of love in return, right? Um, yeah, it's, yeah we're, we're back to the, the Greek agape, right? Um, Jonah was having none of it. The people that Jesus was telling the parable of the Good Samaritan, they were having none of it. Um, and this is exactly it. We, we've made a promise to love, and that vow of love requires responsibility whether or not the love is returned or the responsibility is returned. And that's tough. It, it requires us to be full of the Holy Spirit, really. I, I, can't, I, can't, I just can't manage that constantly without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. Yeah. So we have, we have an immediate responsibility to our family. We have an immediate responsibility to the family of faith. Um, when, when we do, um, like, benevolence and charity here, we, we have, like, a, a responsibility. I just would call it an echo chart. So, so the echo chart is um, the family of God. So we have a responsibility to the folks here. If, if we're looking at, hey, somebody here has a need, somebody within the body has a need, they have first priority, then, then we have, what, our extended family, and then we have the community at large. And, and listen, they're all important. They really are. But what was happening in Israel is they were kind of just cordoning off this group and saying, we only have a responsibility here. And they were refusing to love outside of that inner responsibility. And it's easy to do. Church in America does that all the time. It's about us. And it's all about us. Uh, one of my favorite theologians calls it navel gazing. We're just, <laughs> we're just looking at our belly buttons. It's, it's all about us. And we don't ever look out here. I mean, the disciples did that. Jesus said, 
lift up your eyes. What is he saying? A bunch of navel gazers, lift up your eyes, look on the fields for they are ripe unto harvest. You know, I mean, that's kind of what he was saying. So agape love is where it's at. And that's the vow of love, the vow of responsibility, and the vow of faithfulness all wrap up into that concept. So again, we can't forget that the priority rests on the family, the family of faith, but we also desperately have to serve those in our community. So we don't want to cordon off this group. We want to say, you know, here's our boundary is out here. Um, and we will love equally across the board. We understand resources are limited, so we, we prioritize our resources, but we do not prioritize the love. So we keep loving and caring and taking responsibility to the best of our abilities and, and within the boundaries of our resources that God's given us. Yeah. We have to serve our community, people who are in need, and, wow, well, it's right there in my <laughs> agape love. It's right there um, in my notes. Universal love. Love without regard to repayment or feeling. It's not about the, the warm, fuzzy feelings I get. It's not about whether that person can do anything for me. It's simply about God loves people. And I'm a child of God, therefore, I have to carry that love to them. It's good stuff. All right. Agape. Um, technically, it's universal love. That, that would be the Greek term, universal um, I think the New Testament writers took it and, and kind of molded it to mean unconditional. In, in other words, um, it's not reliant purely on feelings or passions, um, like eros is all passion, right? And friendship can be mu- very more, much more of a feeling-oriented love. Agape is, I'm going to do, it's, it's active, it's decision-based love. So I'm going to make this decision to love, whether there's feelings or not, whether I like the person or not, whether I know the person or not. Again, the, the, the good Samaritan didn't know the guy. That didn't matter. Um, Jonah knew of the Ninevites. He hated him. But he should have known the love of God, and that should have directed his thinking. Even though he felt the way he did, he should have still offered this sense of deci- decisive love. I've made a decision to extend the love of God to them. And he was bitter. Um, he, I mean, the guy was a missionary. And what did he feel about the Ninevites? God, strike them dead. I'd rather have them dead. And, and God's saying, wait a minute. You know that I'm a loving God. He goes, yeah, I know. That's why I didn't want to come here in the first place, <laughs> right? And, and so he becomes this great illustration to us of agape love, which is he should have made the decision just to follow the heart of God toward the Ninevites. If God wanted the Ninevites to repent and have the opportunity to repent, then you go with that. And you make the decision. And the feelings usually come along later. You know, if, if Jonah had given an opportunity, you think about it, if he had softened his heart and said, okay, you love people, I'll go and love them even though I hate them right now. I will demonstrate your love to them. When they repented, instead of being angry and sitting out on the, you know, on the sand dune outside the city waiting for their destruction, he could have enjoyed their restoration and their, their spiritual development. But he didn't, which is sad, right? So... Yeah, yeah. So, so agape is this, I'm going to decide to love, there's no feelings involved, and I don't expect them to give me anything in return. I'm just going to go ahead and make, take that risk. Yes, give love where it's least deserved. Is, yes, is exactly what this whole thing is. So responsibility, it, often the vow of responsibility is doing exactly that. Does this person deserve it? Probably not. Did I deserve it? No. Um, but somebody loved me, cared about me, right? Yeah, I, th- I think that's, that's a great way to put it. Give love where it's le- least deserved. Yeah. And that kind of makes it easier to love the more lovable folks, doesn't it? If, if, if we're practicing love to those that are unlovable or that we don't particularly care for, the other stuff is really easy. You know, loving the people I like is really easy if, if I'm practicing this on a regular basis. So responsible love, that means that when the people in my household aren't carrying on their responsibilities, I still, I choose, I make the decision to love them and nurture them and help them become responsible while I'm demonstrating responsibility to them. And that also makes it easier to love those that are least deserving. 